lands that we have seen this reaping, these are in the times that we are living in. Don't fool yourself to think that this is some statistic that I'm preaching about tonight. These are live and world events. Just earlier today, there was an explosion over in Beirut, uh, <clears throat> an explosion that simply killed 100 people, injured 4,000 people because of this great explosion. And yet, you say some may believe that this is just co co uh, coincidental, but others may say that, hey, it might have the hands of a terrorism on them. What do you believe? I don't know. But I do know this, that today I serve a God who knows all truth. Today I serve a God that understands what is actually happening today. And so why is there so much violence today? I want you to consider <clears throat> along with me <clears throat> why Miss Bethany goes and finds me a water. But I want you to consider along with me that uh, a pastor in Madison, Wisconsin, drove onto the freeway after a recent hospital visit. As he pulled on to the freeway, he pulled into a little, uh, pulled in a little too close in front of him of someone that was driving down the highway. The driver behind this pastor began to honk their horn, began to turn on the flashlights and, uh, and, and, and do all kinds of signals and so forth. You say, preacher, what was he doing? He was mad. He was in a rage that somebody had pulled up in front of him. This pastor had to endure this for about over a mile and a half until the man pulled off or woman pulled off whatever who it was, until this enraged driver pulled off onto their accident. And as the, uh, as the individual uh, uh, got on over, you know how people do, you know how people drive, I watch it all the time. They get behind you and they honk the horn and they want you to, uh, they, they drive up right on your bumper, I mean bumper to bumper, and you're scared to sneeze because you don't know what's going to happen, Amen. But these people, uh, this red driver, they, they drove around. They drove around to get around the pastors just to speed up enough time to get right off the exit. <laughs> but as, he, as the enraged driver drives around, the pastor began to be hold of the bumper stickers that simply describe that you are to have tolerance and love. In your life. Wow. Seems like we've lost that reality, isn't it? Nobody wants to tolerate another individual. Nobody wants to simply have love. And so we find that in the 21st uh, century, it finds that everyone is in open range, in open range to simply have someone to tell you their opinion about you. There is a in the uh, in the there is deep in the human heart a get even kind of spirit in our life, and we are no more tolerant and civilized in our nations today than it was when you look back into the Bible as a story such as Esther. You could see the rage that comes out of the story. You can see that even in a civilized, a, uh, I think of like dealing with the king back, back in those days, it was, uh, it was that you respected, you reverenced certain authority in the lives of people. And yet, we're going to see right from the pages of the Bible that this is something that we've been dealing down through time. And so we think of today that perhaps maybe the greatest crime is a homosexual. And people are simply are preaching and they're hammering on homosexuals. But may I say to you, there is a greater sin than homosexuality. I told you earlier that there was a police officer who is a Baptist preacher and it is in the, you look it up, and it is something that, uh, that is prior, in a prior event right today, 
that he's dealing with perhaps a judgment because of the sermon he preached. Now, I know that there is a hatred towards sin. But any time that you and I lose the, the vision or the understanding of the hatred towards sin and we begin to take our hatred out on other people, you have yourself violated what God has placed into you as a human. And so I want you to see that today that as we look and understand that the mass the massive remarks and the, the aggression remarks and the name calling and the legal persecutions and all of the dislikes that are in this land, as we see all of this, it gives us no right to hate another individual. I don't care what protest that they have. And I'm saying to you, honestly as I can, <laughs> I don't like some of the things that are happening in this world today. But God didn't place me here, nor did he place you here to hate everything in sight. God has placed you and I here. He has left us here to make an impact uh, in the heart of people who have a form of hatred in their life. But we are to make a great impact, not because uh, evil versus evil, but that is good versus good. I mean, good that versus evil. Good should always outwin, and it will always outwin because there's a holy God that stands on his throne, and he has the right to uh, judge you and I because you and I are left as sinners. We are found guilty, but yet God is there judging the course and actions of man. I think of today... As we understand and we find the scene being set and the characters of the story, we must first of all realize uh, that uh, Ahasuerus, how do you say that word again? King Ahasuerus, right? King Ahasuerus, he descended. Look at these characters. Think about it. King uh, uh, Ahasuerus he descended from the Persian named Xerxes. He is said to have ruled from India even unto Ethiopia over 120 provinces, that is simply over the Achaemenid uh, uh, Empire between 486 and 465 B.C. This empire was also called the first Persian Empire that was, a, uh, was an ancient Iranian empire based in Western Asia, founded by Cyrus the Great. This was an empire, I believe, that simply was passed down uh, in the lineage. Normally, uh, you've seen the dynasties that are passed down uh, unto generation to generation. But King Ahasuerus had set a decree against to be vanished. Uh, uh, he set a, cre a decree, excuse me, set a decree, set a banishment for to have his own wife to be banished from his sight. Now go with me so you can find where I'm at as we look into that. Thank you for the water. In uh, Esther chapter 1, Look with me in verse 10. I'm going to show you how deep down in the human heart, why things, why people become uh, to, in their life to deal with their hatred. Let me show you in verse 10. Notice what happened. The Bible says in Esther chapter 1, verse 10, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded, now please forgive me, all right, uh, Mehuman, uh, Bizda, Harbona, Bigda, and Abagatha, Sethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. 
But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. This anger that he had for his wife, his beloved, was so deep entrenched into his life that he forgot and he lost his, the reality that he had gave a vow to this woman to death do his part. <laughs> Amen. What a tragedy that this man has gone back on from a vow that he had given to his wife that he was going to love her and to cherish her, and to provide for her, and to protect her, and to do uh, with her as best ability as taking care of her, and, 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 and all of this stuff, he gone back on it, and so much, so much, that he banished her out of his sight. First of all, you need to see, by King uh, Ahasuerus, that, uh, that he had ministers uh, that was uh, supposed to be his counselors, and they simply, they ministered unto him, telling him, well, you go ahead, O king, and you banish this wife, you show before all of everybody that she, even your wife, will not get away with what she's doing. It's a reality. Today we find that uh, this uh, legal speech, the authorities or the legal actions that are taking place today that you can't preach in the name of Jesus Christ is coming down to where uh, that, uh, that God's people are going to be banished. And, it's not be and they're trying to bring it out that there's a hatred, there's a hate crime being said. When you preach in the name of Jesus Christ, when in all the reality that if you and I stand against and protest any other thing that comes against their values, they ought to be banished. That's what Christians have experienced from down throughout the time. And I want you to see that today, that as King uh, Ahasuerus, as we come to this idea... He, uh, that his wife simply had refused to obey his orders. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll just make you a public example. Notice what the Bible said in verse uh, 12. His anger burned in him. Now, I'll tell you right now, I've only been married for almost 10 years. And I have found that a wife and a husband can get mad at each other. <laughs> there is reality. But when you learn to hate one another, that's not love. That is not love, man. We were watching the other day. I, uh, we finally got, after 10 years... We got the, uh, I, got, I bought a little uh, camcorder when we got married. And uh, I had a friend of mine record the whole uh, ceremony. And uh, we sat up the other day watching it. Stood right there in the middle living room floor. Had the cord hooked up, the camera all hooked up. And it's coming live on the TV screen. Amen? Boy, I thought it was beautiful. Amen? I find myself... Going back, back to the same time, right there. And uh, when my wife said yes, amen, I mean, it's the best thing ever happened to me besides salvation. And uh, you go back and, and uh, you could watch the whole ceremony. And uh, I mean, I was, I don't know, maybe I would just say that I just love my wife. Because at the time, standing on the altar, I was teary-eyed then, and we sat there in the living room watching again, and all over again, I was teary-eyed again. And no matter how many arguments, 
that we have had in our life, I still love my wife, I still want to uphold her, and I still honor and respect her because that's what love is. Hatred is the opposite. Hatred is a form of murder. And I, I just don't understand how King Ahasuerus said that on the vows, on the day of his vows, that he gave his heart to his wife, simply saying that he loves her, he's going to protect her, he's going to provide for her, he's going to do all these great things because she is a worthy individual in his life, but he come to the time that he burned in his anger. He hated what she did. I want you to know today we're living in a world of full of hatred. Let's move on. Think about some of the characters. King Ahazer. Think about Esther. Esther was simply raised by Mordecai. It was her great uncle that raised her. Now, let's go to uh, Esther chapter 2. Look at me in verse 5 through 7. Esther chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was, uh, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jar, uh, Jer, Jer, the son of uh, Shimeon, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried, uh, excuse me, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadesha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Amen. So I want you to see today that Esther was one of the individuals that was brought forth for a time of purification, and she was brought forth for a time of purification uh, according to the king's counselors, saying to him, Get rid of a Vashti and uh, get you a young virgin, young and beautiful and fair virgin, and start all over and, uh, and, and, and maybe, maybe by chance, O oh king, you can train her to reverence you. Now that's the thought, the pattern that came upon uh, this uh, mentality Look with me in verse 8 through 9 as we, uh, as we find this uh, uh, coming out for Esther. Verse 8, uh, chapter 2, verse 8. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when the many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Hege, uh, Hege, that, uh, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the woman. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification, with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her, out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the woman. Now, what you could see today, according to this, that she was probably the most fair looking young virgin than all the other women there. But not only that she was young and fair looking, but there was something about her. There was something about this virgin in her life 
that she was not only good looking on the outside, but she was attractive on the inside. Amen? May I say to you today, sometimes the attraction on the inside has much more greater value than the attraction on the outside. Because the woman one day is going to get wrinkly. Amen? One day she may grow to be more than one. Amen? What I'm saying to you, there's a reality that we must understand. Beauty is deeper than the skin. You say, preacher, what are you trying to say tonight? Well, think of this tonight. The Bible says that God commended his love and that while we were yet sinners, wicked and slothful, hate-filled sinners in our heart, that God seen a beauty that was way deep inside of us a beauty that went way further than simply the outside means. But God looked inside and he looked into you as a soul that would live forever. And God saw something that he gave his life on the cross for you. Because he's seen a, a deep beauty inside you. And yet today we need to understand that beauty goes deeper on the inside of an individual then appears to be on the outside. When I think of tonight, as we consider these things, that, that, uh, uh, that here was a woman preferred by the king, and she was placed into a royal position. In other words, I bet you at her chamber, the king probably had some guards there. And in her chamber... She probably had a whole lot more given to her than all the other young virgin women. Why? Because the king, Ahazar, seen something greater and deeper in her. And you say, preacher, what is that? Well, maybe today what he was really seeing was the beauty of her God. I think of today that here we find throughout the story, and it never makes mention uh, in the story that she was, uh, Esther was a, a, a Christian, but she was a Jew. And automatically, God, God's blessing was already upon that Jew. God's blessing was already uh, there. And, and you could see in the life of a Jew that somehow even though they may live away from the principles of God, that God always blesses and he always takes care of his people. Maybe that's what King Ahasuer was seeing, that she had an inner beauty. That inner beauty wasn't so much of her because, folks, the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. We have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. We need to understand that the only way that today you and I can obtain inner beauty is simply when we give our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what you behold. Doesn't matter who likes you. What matters that you never have the beauty as Esther had until you give your heart to Christ. And so we find these characters. King Ahazard. We find Esther. Third of all, we find Mordecai. Mordecai was very much involved in Esther's life. He was involved in Esther's life because he as the Bible said, as the Bible read, he had raised her as his own daughter. If I was to raise somebody as my own daughter, watch it now, I would be just as much offensive if somebody was to simply look at my daughter the wrong way. You with me? I'm a daddy. <laughs> Amen. 
And I got two precious little daughters, and they're beautiful, amen? My sister-in-law sent me a picture of my, that screaming one back there. And uh, boy, I was like, I was like, wow, she's beautiful. I'm folks, I'm going to tell you right now. A, a, a young guy lays his eyes on my daughter. I might squeeze his neck a couple of times. Amen? Don't think it won't pass by me. Amen? Because you look at my daughter, you, you, and, and you look at her the wrong way, you, know, you have a right to uh, squeeze. You say, preacher, how do you dare to say that? Wait till you get a daughter and you'll be saying the same thing. Amen? Just the way it happens. And you say, what does all that mean today? Well, I want you to understand that Mordecai had raised Esther as his own daughter. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 11. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the woman's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. He sought a right to know where she was at and what she was doing. Amen? I think that's a beautiful thing. You say, preacher, why do you think it's a beautiful thing? Because it shows the love of a man that he has for his daughter when he wants to know where she's at and where she's been and who she's involved with. Amen? Now, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, just as society is, that uh, we're raising, that we're in a society to where thinking that, well, that's wrong to think that way. Well, not according to the Bible. I believe it's a proper point of view. If you think that you're going to raise kids today, and you say, well, you, you go on, and you do whatever you want, and you just uh, bring whoever you want, your friend on, you come on in, and just come on in the house, and we'll take care of you, and we'll feed you, and, and all of that, and, and not have a right to say something? Man, I'll tell you right now, we already laying down the laws in our home. You say, preacher, what do you mean? What kind of laws you laying down? Well, number one, we honor God in our house. Amen. You don't like that. You can step out just the way you stepped in. Amen. And I'm point blank. You come on into my house and I'll take you and show you junk and all. But you can look in the closets and you won't find anything that simply would dishonor God. Amen. You say, well, how can that you be so confident? Because that is how we live in our hearts. Amen? And so I'm saying to you today that, uh, that Mordecai, he, uh, he wasn't just uh, uh, a, a, a fatherly man. He wasn't just somebody trying to raise up uh, his daughter, but he was a Jew. Not only was he a Jew, but he was, the Bible pointed out to us that he was a Benjamite. Go with me to verse 5 and verse 6. Of Esther chapter 2. The Bible reads in verse 5. Now in Shushan the palace. There were a certain Jew. Whose name was Mordecai the son of Jer. The son of uh, Shimei. The son of Kish. Here it is. A Benjaminite. Who had carried. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem. With the captivity which had been carried away. With uh, Jacona, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king uh, uh, of Babylon, had carried away. And so the Jews got dispersed when uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had got ruling over the land. And we find this, uh, they come out, but, uh, I, and, and I understand that he was a Benjamite, and I understand, you know, he was a tribe of the Benjamite, and I understand he was a Jew, but the greatest thing about Mordecai, wasn't that he simply was someone who loved his daughter. It wasn't simply that he was a tribe of the Benjamite. It wasn't simply that he was a Jew himself, that he had some favor. But the thing about Mordecai was someone, he was a man that who was upright and he feared God. Amen? Let me tell you something. I used to hear some of the guys when I was young in construction. What they would tell me, some hunters, yeah, 
A man, a, 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 a guy, a, a boy ever lays his hand on my daughter? We're going to sit down and have a talk with my nine millimeter block. Amen. But I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't got to worry about a block. You ain't got to worry about a man that will carry a pistol or a rifle or a bore an arrow to have a discussion about his daughter. But what you do need to worry about is a man who simply lives an upright life and a man who fears and honors God. That's the kind you better watch. Amen. Because when you place uh, the understanding uh, uh, and the fear that they're walking with God. Listen, the last time I checked and read my Bible, God knows about everything. And he watches. And he's, uh, he has, uh, 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 how you say it, he watches the affairs of men. He watches the affairs of women. God knows what's going on. And I'm going to tell you something, you can't get past God. And I remember being at a young center. I used to think I can get away with sin. But God proved me wrong. Amen. And so I want you to see that these characters, I think about uh, uh, King Ahasuerus, I think about Esther, I think about Mordecai. And then last of all, I want you to consider with me tonight, Haman. Haman. Haman was made to be over uh, and above all the princes. Uh, and so look what the Bible said about Haman in Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, After these things did King Ahasuerus, Promote Haman, the son of uh, 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 Hamethia, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Agatite, and advanced him and set, him, uh, set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not nor did reverence him. And so tonight I want you to see that here was a character of the story, Haman, who was sent, I mean, who was simply set above all of the princes, right? And uh, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, he was set above all of all legal authority. And if you to know and understand uh, Haman was said to be the second in command. Very, very powerful individual. But we find right from the very beginning that Haman wanted everyone to simply bow down and reverence him, right? And everyone did, except Mordecai. You say, preacher, what does all that mean? Well, I just want you to understand that these are individuals, these are characters that we're going to be looking into. And to understand the story and the logist of what's happening, you need to know that each character has a significant part uh, of this story. And, uh, and I think of today that, uh, that Haman was simply the individual uh, that, uh, that I never... What I'm saying to you is that I never told you the title of the story, but I didn't want to until now. <laughs> Amen. Because uh, this story uh, or this sermon is going to be wrought out not by the life of King Ahasuerus or Esther or Mordecai, but today we're going to see that some of the things about Haman are simply some of the things that we're seeing today in our world. And so the title of this sermon is The Hater That Was Killed by Hate. The Hater That Was Killed by Hate. To know the story as we may understand uh, today that, uh, that crime among the land and today in the societies is not, uh, uh, we find that the crime is there 
and we find murder, we find uh, uh, the, uh, the, the movement of the LBG and all of that and, 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 and all of that, you know, and, and uh, we find the racial violence, we find the drug abuse, and, and you can find all the crime you want to think about, abortion, all of that, but the greatest crime is when a man or a woman allows hatred into their heart. You're saying that, that, that's not the greatest crime. It is. Because one day you're going to be judged by it. I think of today, the greatest crime that we find is hatred. Let me tell you this tonight. Hatred is the disposition deep inside one's will and emotions to destroy something or someone. That bears repeating. Let me, let me say it one more time. Hatred is the disposition deep inside one's will and emotions to destroy something or someone. You say, preacher, you don't know what hatred is. Well, I hate to break your bubble. But before I ever understood what hatred was, I mean, uh, I, before I ever understood what love was, I learned how to hate. Amen? You say, well, how did you learn how to hate? Well, I hated everything. I hated, the, I hated what I went through. I, I, I hated the people treating me wrong. I mean, I, I was in a hateful time in my life. And it went on into my life. Way even after I was saved. Because I didn't understand what hatred was. And today, there are things that I hate, but it's not people. Amen? Now, I hate what people do, but I don't hate people. I can honestly stand here today and tell you that I have no enemy. Amen? I mean, I've taken care of my enemies. You say, how did you take care of it? I learned to love them in Jesus' name. I don't hate. And I wouldn't say, I couldn't say that for other people. I'm sure that there are people today that hate me. I've learned being in the ministry, Satan hates me. His cohorts hate me. Amen. The principalities and the powers that I stand against, they hate me as well. Amen. There are many things that, uh, that we, that hates. But may I say to you that the hater, he, uh, the hater wants the object of their hatred to be negated, removed, and gone. And we are seeing today that hatred is what's plaguing our nation, our cities, our towns, the whole world. I think of the hatred that are not just simply going on in America, but I think of today over in the Middle Eastern, where there are, there are many, the Afghanistans and all them other cities that they hate even today. The Jewish nations. And hatred is being... Sought out today, and I think of today that uh, hatred is what's plaguing our world, and hatred has gone past a moral neglect, but is, it has become a great passion upon the land. You say, how do you know that? Well, I think of today that as we can view in Scripture, the word hatred is sometimes used Classically, and sometimes used in minor attitudes or mild attitudes, simply depending on the situation. But may I say to you, hatred is something that is complex. And when you look into the scripture, you can't simply morally out, just simply, well, this is what hatred is. And there's no, uh, no uh, undermining or no subdivision about hatred. But yet that's not true. Because hatred comes out in different forms, just like love comes out in different forms. I think of today, we, if we were to talk, be talking about love, uh, love comes out and by four different categories. 
Number one, it comes out uh, by this, uh, uh, by, it's a Greek word called uh, storage, and uh, it simply means an empathy bond, uh, which refers to a natural liking someone through a fondness or a familiar area out of someone. In other words, like, I, I like, I love Miss Debbie Flagg because she likes the things that I like. Amen? A familiar bond. Or she knows somebody, and I know them too, and uh, we've learned to like each other, love each other in that formal way because of the association. And then this uh, second one is uh, filialia, which is a friendly bond, and it is often translated into a brother love between friends, such as a close siblings. Amen? And that's why we normally call each other, well, this is Brother Harrison or Brother Rose, because it is a brotherly type love, a brother love where it simply has a unity about the friendship. We agree. We love each other. We're, we're, we're not going to harm each other because this is like a brother love. This is a friendly love. We have a bond. We have a closeness together. You don't hurt the people you love, do you? No, nah, I don't think you do. Because that's not what love is. You take care of them. You provide for them. You, you want to do for them because you love them. And then we have uh, uh, the Greek word eros, where we get uh, the word uh, or the, the type of romantic love, a love between a man uh, and, a, uh, and uh, a man and his wife, a romantic love, right? A, uh, 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 when a man and a woman is married, the Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews that their bed is undefiled. But when a man gives himself to a woman or a woman gives himself uh, outside of, of marriage, it is not simply a blessing by God, but it is simply a fortification where God will put his judgment on one day because it is a Romantic, you could say, romantic way of fortification, but yet a sense of uh, deriving of sinful acts outside of marriage. And God doesn't place his blessings on outside the marriage, but he curses and he condemns that. Because God has a hatred, folks. His hatred isn't towards people, but his hatred is towards sin. And so we find that storage, uh, uh, storage and uh, philiatia and a rose. And the fourth category of love is an agape love. That is a love that simply a, uh, a man cannot have unless he gets it from God. A agape love, an unconditional love. That is a love that simply God has for you and I. He unconditionally loves us even though we're hateful and we are sinners and we can be condemned because of that sin. God loves us unconditionally. God commanded his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. I don't understand that love. Well, I was thinking today and thinking about the, my, uh, my pastor that came back home and thinking about, you know, writing him a letter and, and, uh, and, and, and writing with the understanding that, you know, I, I never dreamed and never thought about God having me to be a, uh, a, a local Bible Baptist minister and all of that. And, and, and I was thinking that, wait a minute now, uh, I can't think about that God called me to be a local Bible Baptist minister without thinking that why would God even allow me to be a Christian? Because I was a sinner. Right from the very beginning. <laughs> I don't know why God loves me, but I am grateful today. Amen. So what I'm saying to you tonight is that preachers 
as preachers, we would need to identify within preaching those texts and bring out the meaning and the representations on what preach, uh, or, or, or when we preach about hate and what hate really is. I think of the tonight, Amos chapter 5, verse 15. Notice what the Bible says. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. Tonight we are to hate the evil. Amen? When you hate something about an individual, you are to hate that evil. And I think tonight that Mordecai had the right to hate what was happening in his life. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, Mordecai had discovered that there was a plot. And the plot was to come against, to kill all the Jews. And Mordecai had hated that with a pure hatred because it was love for people. Amen? I think that tonight, Christians should have an understanding of what hate is. We, are, we, should, we should remove ourselves from having a hate speech and that we're not hating the individual, but that we are hating the evil that is in the individual. And we must be careful how to deal with that because the reality is that folks can get hurt. So we're learning to teach our daughters and our sons some things. You know some of the things we're, hate, we're, we're teaching them today? Number one, we hate lying. Don't lie to my face. Amen? Because God's going to let me know the truth. You say, well, how's God going to let you know the pr truth, preacher? Because I, I am a man that is driven by truth. I am a man that upholds a rightful life in my life. And uh, I fear God. And I want to learn how to eschew evil like Job did. And so God's going to always let me know the truth. Amen. Man, my kids don't know, Miss Kathy. They don't understand it, that when I know, when I, Daddy hadn't been there all day, but Daddy knows the truth. Amen. God reveals it. You can't lie in my face, amen? Well, you think you might try it and get away with it, but you know what? Uh, you just put yourself in a bad situation, amen? You're going to deal with God a little bit more. Because my children, understand this, now watch it. If my children stand boldly and lie to my face, watch it, as a representative of Jesus Christ, they're not only lying to me, but they're lying to Jesus Christ as if they were lying to him face to face. And so I want you to see Amos chapter 5, verse 15. The Bible says, hate the evil, love the good, amen, and establish judgment in the gate. In other words, when you get out of line, Brother John, you get out of line. I, I, I tell my children, when you get out of line, Guess what? You know, I, 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 want, I, want, I love you, and I love you all my heart, but I have to hate the evil. And not only do I have to hate the evil, but I have to judge the evil. Amen? According to the Bible. Because if I spare the rod, the Bible teaches it spoils the child. And ain't nobody going to be no more spoiled than I am. Amen? You say, preacher, what do you mean? I, well, I come home, Miss Kathy. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I come home. You know, if I, if I work somewhere, Miss uh, Ms. Flagg, if I work somewhere, I come home. Uh, my little daughter, Lydia, she come in there, take off my shoes. Amen. Now, now, Abigail is already trying to learn how to take off my socks and all, you know. They're trying to take care of daddy. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I used to think that I was prideful to allow my children to do that. But I remember, wait a minute, I remember when my dad used to come home, we used to try to wrestle his cowboy boots off. And, uh, and, and then if you could get the boots off, that was wonderful. So we raced to get the boots off because nobody wanted to take his socks off. Man, oh man, amen. So you race, when daddy got home, he put his feet up, take the boot off, because the brother had to take the socks off. Whew. Man, terrible. But what I want to say to you tonight, that here Amos, 
He gave us a clear understanding that we are to hate evil and love the good. May I say to you tonight, tonight, evil cannot be an oversight, uh, uh, evil cannot be an overnight guest in our life. Amen? You can't be somebody that is trying to do right before God and just say, you know what? I'm going to let my guard down and you just go ahead and do whatever you want. Evil come right on in. Because the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which evil, cleave to that which is good. It is a commandment to hate evil. Amen? I wish God would give me a, a greater hatred for evil in my life. Amen? Oh, I, it's a wonderful thing to be able to serve Lord. But you know what, folks? Sometimes we just kind of, we just invite evil to come in and spend the night with us. You know, you say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, sometimes we allow those besetting sins to come in and just control us, take us over. And the Bible teaches that it ought to be like that. Not any time we are to hate our brother. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt, uh, thou shalt, shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and, uh, and not suffer sin upon him. I think of Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 11, 12. But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and flee into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Right? I mean, that's... Old Testament prophecy, I mean, Old Testament uh, 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 verses there, but we don't see that happening today. Uh, but if we did, perhaps we would see less of murder. Amen? If people back in the old days had their hands, back in the 1800s, if somebody stole, they had their hand cut off, I think today we would have less robbery. You wouldn't have to worry about people coming in and uh, breaking down your door and stealing your stuff when you ain't there. What I'm saying to you, if we uphold the laws of the Bible, perhaps we would see a great difference in our land today. But what is happening today is that people aren't abhorring evil. They are abhorring good. They are hating the good things of life. Jesus Christ showed us in his sermon on the Mount of, uh, uh, on the Sermon on Mount, he showed us the spiritual intents of the Ten Commandments, which involves the thoughts and the, uh, the, the intents and the attitudes of an individual. Matthew chapter uh, 5, if you would. Matthew chapter 5, and real easy to find, Amen. Matthew chapter 5, we, uh, look with me in verse 3. The Bible begins to read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We find here in the Bible that, uh, that there was not one individual that could be blessed without them taking upon their lives the thoughts and the intents and the realities of their actions. But today, we believe, uh, but today we're seeing that there's a world that is trying to produce some other way. May I say to you today, you cannot produce a righteous lifestyle by living in sin. It won't never happen. Those who follow Jesus' example will simply obey God's commandment in the letter and in the spirit. But those who simply break the law in the letter of the spirit 
uh, spirit without repentance will not receive even the gift of eternal life. A murderer without repentance will not enter into the gates of heaven, nor even with a fornicator. Right? You say, what do you mean? Well, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And so we ask the question, what can we learn from Haman's hatred? What could we learn from Haman's hatred? Well, you're going to have to come back next week to find out. Amen? I want you to know today, as we're looking into our society, the greatest crime that is being committed, even in the local church, is this form of hatred. You see, when God is in control of your heart, you're going to learn to hate the things that God hates and love what God loves. But if you're going to allow hatred into your heart, you're going to hate everything that Satan hates. And Satan hates people. He's hated them from the very beginning. He hated Adam and Eve, tripped them up through his subtlety, and he did it. He's been doing it since drowned through time. Satan hates you and I, and his greatest desire is for you to be in hell with him. And you say, preacher, I don't like that. Well, that's Bible truths. If you don't like it, you don't like God. Amen? Bottom line, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, make friends here, amen? If I, have made, if I was trying to make friends in my preaching, well, I would have stopped a long time ago. But I want you to know, we as Christians, we, we are to hate the evil. We are to abhor. We are to hate evil in our lives, but we don't hate the individual. Maybe today you're here without Jesus Christ. What you got in your heart is hatred for every principle, for everything that's good, for everything that could be good in your life. You have a hatred. Your hatred is not because you think that you are a good person, but your hatred, first of all, is towards God. You hate God because you don't understand what he stands for. God is here to save you, redeem you. But folks, if you think that you can live a life without Christ and think that one day you're going to enter into a, a, uh, eternity in heaven without Christ, you're fooling yourself. In fact, you even hate yourself. You know, one thing that you can learn to do tonight is to realize that in your hatred, if you begin to hate the things that God hates, you might see that you might begin to hate the things you do. That's what I hate today. I hate the things that I do. I don't hate my wife. I love her just as much as I love her in the beginning. But sometimes I hate the things she does and vice versa. Sometimes she hates the things that I do. Amen. And we got to learn how to work it out in love. Would you stand with me tonight as we would stand here tonight and every head bowed and every